So David Wolfram's here. Carolyn's not here yet. Um, at some point, once Carolyn logs on, Trevor probably won't be here because he's been ill. Um, Carolyn may want to convene the select board meeting as well, just in case they want to have a conversation, a more in-depth conversation. But really, Mary and I are going to present um, mostly Mary. Um, <laughs> going to present what we we discussed this we played phone tag all day um or i should say email tag all day we have some information that we'll screen share with you and then we'll chat so do you want to take it away mary or do you want how do you why want me to do why don't you screen share the report so that i can see people's faces while we're screen sharing because I don't have two screens going on, but I'm happy to share. Do you want okay, to call the meeting on. to order? Yeah, yeah she... Raloon and they have to, uh, uh, while you guys call the meeting to order, I'll grab my information. All right, so should we call to order? Yes, I and do, should we, it, do we, should we do, do we do need to introduce ourselves? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting the, the protocol with our, um, with our, with our remote meetings here. You would think I'd know by now, but um, I'm Raloon Bialik, um, the chair of the personnel board. And I'm Lisa Middens, secretary of the personnel board. Erica Higgins Ross, member of the personnel board. John Pereski, a member of the personnel board, and I can't do video tonight. Can you see your video, John? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure before I start screen sharing. And Eric is here too. <clears throat> All right. You ready, Mary? Sure. Okie dokie. I'm not promising I will do this well. I have it up. Okay, you get it. I think so. Can everybody see this? Yep, you can see it. All right, hold on to your tummies while I scroll. <laughs> <laughs> but he said that in a meeting I was at last week and it made me laugh. Mary, uh, could, could you make it a little bit bigger? Mm -hmm. Us old guys can't read the small print. Yeah, it's really not. It's you know, it's not like it's a PowerPoint. Casey, did you email this to everybody right before the meeting? I did, literally. Right Does everybody that. have access to their email? It might be easier just to follow along. I don't have two screens, so. Right, but we could block this screen and you could open it on your own. And you could see your Zoom in one corner. I, can I see obviously it don't have a copy of this, so. Yeah, I can see it on there. I think it's all right. All right. And really, it's no. just. No. All right, Casey, I'm just going to jump in and then we can. Okay. And maybe focus in on some things. So it's really, this is just to highlight the report that you've gotten via email. Take your time to read it. This is not a done deal. You'll see the very big word draft on it. This is just our initial report to you so you have a sense of what's going on. I'm gonna walk you through the report and then really answer any questions and talk about the decision points moving forward. Um, so just very briefly, I'll go through it. Clearly the introduction tells you uh, about you receiving the grant from the community compact to do this project, which was uh, you know, a smart move on the town's point to get some grant money to do this review, which is very important because I know, and I've actually been involved in the past with some of the work the town has done on a piecemeal level. Uh, first, looking at a few job descriptions and then looking at salaries and then uh, having transition in the town administrator role more than once with different ideas of what was needed. So, and without looking at 
the whole system at once. So it was smart of the town to get through um, all of this at one time. You'll see that the, the whole purpose of it was to come up with new position descriptions. Many people feel that studies like these are uh, salary studies or upgrade studies. We really view it as a job description study because without having accurate job descriptions, you have no system. So the, the priority from our point of view, which is not always the priority of the employees, is to make sure that you have accurate job descriptions reflecting what people are really doing and taking a look at comparable worth within the organization. The internal equity issues are far more important than the external salary issues. And the good news is that we found that your current structure is, is pretty good in terms of the grades. So what we did to do the position descriptions is we sent out job descriptions to everybody as part of the study. We did individual meetings with them to talk about their, their positions. And then the reason this is highlighted is because the drafts are not quite finished yet. We got pulled into a police survey. We got pulled into some library positions. Um, so those aren't quite finished yet, which is why they're, they're highlighted. What we did after we did the interviews, we did an evaluation. And you go to the next page, Casey, because that shows the things we evaluated. We use a rating system, which is standard in uh, the municipal world. We evaluated positions based on how closely is somebody supervised? Do they supervise people? Are they really representing the town in a function such as in finance or health? Are they the face of the town for that area of expertise? Most of your department heads would be, would be that. We uh, evaluate the education and the years of experience required. And it really is a point factor system positions come up with scores or ratings. And that shows the relative value um, or grouping, as you would say. And currently you have grades, it's the same sort of thing. So the table that you can see on this page, if you scroll down, Casey, is the groupings that we came up with based on the job description, uh, questionnaires, interviews, and then our review. So you'll see for the sake of argument, we have put uh, letter grades on these. They're not really that different. Currently you have grades one through six. Uh, this provides for another grade and separates out a few positions, but really what you have is not that far off. We do have a, a few new positions since the time the town did the classification structure. That would be the assistant public works, um, we did just at the last personnel board meeting um, modify uh, the, the rating on an adult uh, circulation at the library. We put that in there. Um, I know the town is contemplating a community service or a social worker. That is not on this schedule. We, we were not at the point of you know, decision point in evaluating, evaluating that position. So this is the compensation, the classification structure. You'll see if you compare it to your existing structure, which we didn't include in part of this report, which we can in the future, it's not that far off. Um, a few positions did get moved a little bit, um, but it's really, it's re your structure is not bad. So then when you go to what we did for the salary schedule, which would be on the Next, the compensation survey. What we did is we chose, uh, based on area, uh, a number of municipalities. We can, um, we determined it by the market. Oftentimes, that's a good place to stop. Oftentimes, people think of, oh, we need a comparable town. We need a town with the same population. Well, if the town has the same population equalized value and they're in Middlesex County, they're not really a market survey. So we really look to the area and we did um, Ashfield, Conway, that's under where it says compensation. It might be up one previous page, I'm sorry. Um, I'll just read them off. 
Ashfield, Conway, Gill, Greenfield, Hadley, Leverett, Montague, Northampton, Northfield, Shelburne, Sunderley, Waitley, and Williamsburg. We looked at, we received data from all of those municipalities to come up with our recommendations. We did, after receiving the data, we did remove Northampton from our analysis. It's good to know what those numbers are, but the size and the scope of the work in Northampton is just not comparable enough. So what we then did is we looked at your existing structure. What we found in the survey, and you can see it bolded here, is that your current structure has an enormous pay range. The market, the, the labor, um, the general practice of the industry is to have pay ranges of 25 to 30%. Uh, the current Deerfield structure has a 50% range, which is incredibly large. Um, what we suspect is over time, steps have been added to the maximum, but the minimum has not been addressed. So what we found in the survey is that all of your starting pays are significantly below the market. In many instances, I don't want to say all, but in most instances, which is also reflected that the town hasn't been able to hire people at the minimum of the pay range for in many occurrences of trying to hire. So we took that into account when we were developing the salary schedule. I will note here, you'll see here that it says um, police during the time of this this um, review, it became clear to whatever powers that be, whether it comes from the police department, the town administrator, the personnel board, the, the, the select board, that studying the base pay of police is not a truly effective way to measure how the town compensates police officers. So we have done a supplemental survey. We're still receiving that data. Uh, and we'll do a separate report on that because what you find with police is often it's their other pay, not their base pay that drives their total compensation. So we're collecting data on shift differentials, educational incentive, all of those things that actually go into base pay. And we did add two municipalities to that based on the chief's recommendations. So before we sent that survey out, the chief and I met and came up with what we were gonna ask in the survey and which municipalities we were gonna collect data from. So it was great to work with him to come up with a plan. So then when we look at what's the development of the salary schedule for you all uh, on the general government side, not in the, in the police department. So we're kind of carving that out and I will show you this, the salary data, the survey in here when we get to it. What we did is we looked at the market survey data and we found that, um, let, um, Casey, if you scroll to the attachment that shows the minimum pay salary, it would be the attachment, scroll down to, here we go, here we go. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I'm making you jump around. It would be around page eight. Go back a few pages. Oh, I see. This one. Yep, right there. Okay. So one thing that happens in your area, and we deal with this all the time, is that a lot of municipalities don't have pay ranges. They have single set pays. And that's deceiving because somebody with a single set pay could be new in the job or they could be there for 20 years. So it's really a challenge to find comparable data. So you'll see with all of these blank spaces that look blue, that's because we did not have enough data points on those positions. One area we had trouble comparing was you are one of the very few in the, in the Commonwealth that have the com combined treasurer collector clerk. So there's not an awful lot of data on those positions, but we did collect data on treasurer collector, on clerk, and we coalesced that information. So when you look at this page, you can see all the red ink. The red ink that you see 
means that these positions are under the market for the minimum pay. This is an analysis of minimum pay. And when you see something, you know, you can look at it and say, oh, it's $2, it's $3, it's $5. Well, if you work full time, $2 an hour is over $4,000. So um, it is significant. Um, some of the market are significant below the market. You'll see we use the min, we use the average and we use the median. We do that so that we can find outliers uh, in the data. And um, we use the minimum in this case as a bit of a guideline. So if you go to the next page, Casey, I can, I can see some of the positions on the next page. Right, the same sort of thing. So when you see the black ink, you'll see that those numbers are small, 28 cents, 77 cents. That means you're right in the market in some of those positions. Um, for example, your administrative assistant at the police department is in the market when you see that, but you'll see that your assistant town clerk is $4 under. And you can see that because you see that the top of the Deerfield range for that is 2472, yet your police administrative assistant is 2884. That's a big difference in pay for one has statutory authority and one has a broader scope of work. So when you see the classification, putting those positions together, you'll see how we adjusted some of those. So then we look at the next pages, Casey, are the maximum pay analysis. You'll see only one position is below the maximum range. So that tells you it's the bottom of your range that is the problem. So that's what we, we built on. Um, so what we did is we, if you go to the next one, Casey, and I'll show you the one that has the green, you'll see here on the maximum, this is your current pay scale. You'll see where it says step one, step two, step three, step four. I've highlighted those in green. Those are your current first four steps. Then you see the last column says step 10. That's your current Step 10, these steps are 5% between, meaning your 50% range. That is an extremely generous range, but again, it's not that generous because you can't hire anybody at the bottom of the range. So what we've done is recommended you adopt a, a pay range. And one of the decision points you need to make is do you want to have a range with steps. You'll see here that if you want to continue a range with steps, we're suggesting you start above step four and you can see how we've called that a new step one. And what we did is we split your steps of 5% into two and a half percent. A two and a half percent step increase is much more the norm particularly if you are applying a COLA. So you have been giving people 5% plus a COLA. Now, the fact that their top pay is in the market means that they were really below the market as they've been moving through. So it's really a perfect time to adjust to get you back into where you should be. So, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that you'll, the town will have to decide is, are you gonna go with a step system or go with a range system? So Casey, if you wanna go back to the report and show the table of the ranges, that's probably on about page seven. There he goes, was I right? So when you look at this, you'll see that these recommended range, ranges correspond to the steps on that last that we had the two and a half percent. Many boards, it really is a philosophy. Do you wanna have a range that you move people through based on performance appraisal? Or do you wanna have a known entity of having a step increase each year and maybe adjusting the pay scale by uh, a cost of living? Um, that's a policy decision that you all should, should make. 
you're used to having a step system, your employees are used to having a step system. And I will tell you 75% of the work we do, we see a step system being adopted. In many cases, we see a shifting downward of the, the value of steps to uh, two or two and a half. That is the norm out there. If you, if you look around to other municipalities and see what their step rates are, it's two or two and a half percent, sometimes three. But um, it really, especially if you're going to fix the minimum of the range, so really what we've done is we've dropped 20% off of your 50% range and it's not really changing it that much. So there are some decisions when you implement of are you going to, for this July, for example, if somebody who's currently working, here it is May 1st, thinks they're getting a 5% raise on July 1st, you all need to decide, are we going to do that or are we going to make it the two and a half percent. You may want to put it off a year and build in some sort of COLA for this year. It really does depend how you want to implement it. But our recommendation is the same, whether you go with the ranges or whether you go with the steps, the value of the ranges are, you know, pennies off, we rounded for that. So you'll see that it's 1640 to 2059, when on the chart above, we said 17 to 22, only because we didn't want to bother with the rounding of that. Because one reason to do it with the pay scale this way is that people at the 5%, you won't need to change their pay rates. So every other step here is one of your existing pay rates. So then the implementation cost would be less than it would be if you create a whole new system because your structure is not far off. We have recommended movement from one grade to another. And you'll see that we did add a, a grade seven, so to speak, here and have that range instead of being the 34 to 42, we've added for your senior kind of cabinet level positions a range of 36 to 45. So there would be one added there that does not exist now. Okay. And maybe Casey, we can go back to the table of the positions in which grade and that will highlight that point. Please. No, back, 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 back there. Okay. So you'll see that we've got um, E and D Oh no, up, up, one more. Up. Yeah, there we go. I'm like, wait, it got cut off. There's yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, there is more. So what we did is create a G level for the public works, the building commissioner, the town accountant, and your town clerk, treasurer, collector. Those were all morphed into the F level. So that grade six, and that's not really reflective of the much higher and broader responsibility of those in G with all due respect to department heads, obviously they have important jobs, they're doing budgets, but they're really confined to one area of the organization. Uh, your G level really do supersede um, and have higher responsibility, complexity, and oversight over municipal operations. So that's how those come out in terms of um, the point factor and how we rated them. So that's my brief overview. And I know we jumped around a little bit. Um, I'm happy to answer questions or explain anything I might've gone over too quickly. So let me ask a question, um, Mary. So when we're talking about the G level, which would essentially, you know, it sort of correlates to us creating a seven in what we normal in what we're looking at for our current yep. system. Um, one of the reasons I just want to make sure I'm right about this. One of the reasons 
like you just said, is you've got a pretty wide breadth of, of responsibility for these positions. For instance, the public so works who, superintendent. Who's going to replace Scott then? Anybody? <laughs> Unmute. Um, I don't know who's talking. That's Jonathan. <laughs> Going on now through Saturday. Jonathan? Um, <laughs> mute yourself. I think whoever owns it can mute everybody. I, well, I, that's the thing. I was looking to mute and then unmute. <laughs> You're getting the, the not, the not as um, technically savvy moderator tonight. Um, so anyway, what was I, what I was going to say is you've got a pretty broad range of responsibility. Public works superintendent is covering five divisions, not just highway. And right. it requires some expertise across those divisions. The, the clerk treasurer collector is covering essentially three divisions. Um, the building commissioner, it's, it's, and I think this is an element of the position that isn't always understood, it's become very apparent to me in the last year based on the requirements of the building commissioner, that's also a public safety position. And so that element of the work now feels like it's been more captured to me, but I don't know that any, that everybody would see that nuance because they aren't, they aren't, privy to all the information that's come across my desk as it relates to COVID and other public safety issues. You know, there are times that the building commissioner has to go out in a public safety facility, um, in a public safety manner for the health and well-being of the residents if there's a fire, if there's, you know, some sort of a storm that's created damage to buildings that he might have to inspect. Um, to determine whether it's safe to be in that building. So these are nuances I think that not everybody is, it, it sees every day. And I just wanna make sure that I'm right in that assumption, Mary. Well, certainly, certainly that's true. Building commissioners have to work hand in glove with uh, fire departments and police departments. There's so many things that um, and the statutory, you know, authority is, is huge with building commissioners and they're your zoning and, you know, there, there's, there's many hats to that. Yes. It, it crosses. Yeah, I didn't even hit the zoning. Yeah. So, and it crosses, you know, all of your development, all of your economic development, you know, so those positions. And I have to say, the reason they're also in that higher level is because of the salary survey. So we coalesce the data on those things. So, mm -hmm. you know, so the market survey also feeds some of some of that, but it's also the internal equity that feeds that because, and again, every, every position is valuable um, and every position has its role in the organization, but there are some things, particularly the accountability for safety. Correct. It, you know, those, those weigh more heavily and um and that's, why that's one thing yeah that's one thing i didn't even touch is the accountability in a lot of these positions now one thing judgment in your, requirements one thing in your town that is a little bit unique is your finance structure um you know yes. you have treasurer collector clerk and then you have the town accountant who is almost a budget director. Neither one is technically a finance director, but they're Correct. operating for different reasons at that larger, larger level. So um, again, each organization is unique and what causes the, the value. And I have to say, you're in a tough market for finance people because some of the competition is private vendors like Furcock, you know? Yes. And, and you've got, you know, this market that's a little funky, you know, so you've got to take that into consideration too. So this is where we, we came out. I think it's, you know, obnoxious of me to get this to you so late and then ask you to have questions on it. So what I would like to do is give people time to read it. Us and 
come up with questions. I know some people couldn't be here tonight. And I know we had talked about another date that I am making myself available. I just want to do the will of the committee and what makes the most sense. So one thing that might be useful for everybody is I have Mary scheduled for May 5th to come talk to the select board. Um, and that could be a useful thing. It'll give people time to chew on this and possibly come up with questions they might not have thought of. I do that all the time. This is my brain processes at three in the morning. So <laughs> it might give everyone a little bit of time. And then it, you are more than welcome to join us at the select board meeting. But I do think if we're gonna make some, I think, it, I think it's a good conversation to have with the select board as both committees really oversee the dual responsibility for reviewing compensation, but also the hiring authority statutorily responsibility because that's the select board. Um, the bylaw requires that the personnel board go through these periodic compensation reviews. And I just think having witnessed the finance committee capital and the select board working together lately, I think it's a very useful thing to have a lot more um, conversation because I think I see people problem solving in a way that I hadn't seen before. Um, does anybody have any questions about these things? So my mouse died, but these, these are the criteria that happen in your job descriptions. A lot of you have seen this in your own job descriptions, but not everybody that hasn't seen um, the types of performance management systems that are often used in municipal and state government. Not everybody's familiar with what these terms mean. And these are FLSA terms, aren't they, Mary? Based on it, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. on the criteria. And what is also, and I'm glad you mentioned that, um, what is wonderful about this process is it also is evaluating the position, not the person in it. And that's very important. And that's also important under the, the relatively new mass pay equity laws, where you have to evaluate your positions for comparable worth, this system does that. So we historically see, while the town, your town is better off than most when it comes to um, predominantly male or female positions, that you actually do have some of your, quote, historically softer positions of library director and senior center. Now you have a regional senior situation, right? Yeah, Correct. So that position is probably within the market um, because of that regional nature. But oftentimes, and in some of your program and outreach coordinator positions, they were yes. very low. Those did get moved up within your system. Now, Casey and I spoke and we just wanted to be clear. We use letters, but if you go down the route of kind of modifying your existing structure, we can switch back to your existing grade structures using one through six and then just adding a seven. Um, if that's gonna keep it cleaner, I would quite frankly ask the accountant, you know, what makes the most sense in terms of okay. your, your systems. Um, we sometimes change it from letters to numbers or vice versa so that people, you know, your pay is a morale issue. No, yes. In this situation, has been quote downgraded. There's been a few that have been upgraded. Um, so I wouldn't worry about maintaining a numerical system and it might be a little bit cleaner and easier for the finance team. To change to, to continue Keep it as numbers, system? just add okay. a seven. Okay. And so that was one of the things that was driving my questions in the beginning of this entire process is, have we reached a, an evaluative uh, point where we can say our jobs fit the market? That's the purpose, right, Mary? Okay. Yes. And, and quite frankly, other than those, uh, um, other than those at step four or below, you are within the market. We, we're not recommending, you know, we're recommending kind of tweaking the top end of the range only to make it fit the steps. But okay. 
uh, no, you're not underneath the market at, at the high end. So I think it's a great time to do it. It's not going to be costly to implement this. You have our, the only people, only cost will be um, people who might be in steps one through four. You okay. Know, they would get a bump if you're going to move them up. But there are only one or two because you haven't been able to recruit at that level. Right. You know, so right. the impact is not significant. So it's really, which is why I said, if, because I know it would be lousy, you know, if I'm at step five, you know, um, you know, grade five, step four, and I'm scheduled to go to step five, you know, on July 1st, I'd be a little disappointed not to get my 5%. You may choose to implement it in January or implement it for next July. But I think you have to do the analysis of where people fall right now. And, and we we'll, can probably do that, Casey, if you want. Um, I was just going to ask. Next, I think we need to the do next that analysis. Meeting, because I, I think, you know, cost impact would be important. And then what becomes level service, you know, and you may want to take, take a look at that. I also think that you want to right size, not downsize, and you don't want to, you have valuable employees. I wouldn't want to quote harm anybody over the next year, but at some point you're going to have to say, this is our new system. Right. And then you would need to address the issue of, are you applying and across the board? We'll have to look to see how many people are actually currently at the maximum. But again, that's a COLA conversation, you know, to have kind of on a parallel track. Okay, Lisa has a question. Uh, yes, I have a question, Mary. Can you talk a little bit more about what the study is that you're doing um, for the police department and how that fits in with this classification study since the police are in a union and that's a whole separate system for determining pay and- Yeah, you know, um, yeah, and Casey, we probably don't need the screen, the, that share anymore. Um, so the things that were in the police, the, the feedback at the beginning was that this survey wasn't addressing the needs of the police department. I think it was after we had a good conversation, the chief and I, um, I think his mindset was, I've got to know truly comparable for when I do bargaining, which is coming up, you know, and, and, and if he were on this call, he would say that that's what was the case was. Our, our project that we started with was not that. It was a classification and compensation structure. How are we doing with our job descriptions? And I think either lack of understanding, lack of communication on my part, um, that there was a disconnect from the, the police perspective. Um, and whether it's a full-time department, a part-time department, how many departments are truly comparable, all valid points. So we were able to regroup the things that we have asked for in the survey. And I know my data person is just back from um, vacation today. So I was not able to get, um, I'm just trying to look at my survey here. Um, we asked for, not only did we ask for the base pay, we asked for things like, is there an educational incentive? You know, the, the former Quinn bill, is there an evening shift differential, a night shift differential, an officer in charge differential, a detective stipend, a school resource. So while your department base pay may be a little bit less, and although we found it right in the market, and again, I, I applaud any department head who wants to advocate for their employees, you have some healthy differentials. An officer in charge gets $4 more per hour. Again, $4 more, more per hour over a year is $8,000 if you figure 20, 2080 hours. So until we get the data back, I think it's hard. So the chief is absolutely right. It wasn't an apples to apples because base pay and police and fire are almost an anomaly because it doesn't represent what people actually get paid. 
So whereas an administrative assistance base pay, a health director's base pay is what they get. Um, so I think that, and then it will help the chief um, get ready and the board get ready for collective bargaining, which is coming up, not this year, but next year. So I think it'll be a, a great foundation. Uh, they have good job descriptions. They don't really need new job descriptions because their job descriptions are their ranks. So I'm curious to see what the data shows. And I'm hoping I could probably even have, because Jen is just back from vacation today. Um, and I know this survey was sent out well before she went away. So we might have some salary data for the meeting on, on the 5th, uh, data, not that it might not be analyzed and um, because it is a challenge when you're bargaining with the unions. Um, the chief was surprised to know I sit on the Joint Labor Management Committee, so I know how they work. You know, they say we're always going to lose at the JLMC. That's not true. I was <laughs> not wrong. You don't always lose at the JLMC, um, but having good data is what you need if you end up there. So, and I have full faith okay. that the town will not end up there. Was there anything else um, you had a question about, Lisa? Uh, no. So, so when? Well, one other question is: Will will, will this study be presented to the personnel board or to the town, or how will we see the results of this study for the, for the police department? Oh, the, the same way you would hear okay. here. We started that after the fact, so, but there's less data to collect. So I could be sitting here with Jen having almost all that data done. So it may end up being finalized at the same time. The police is very narrow and, and, and clear cut and easy to understand. There's not the, how did we grade them? You know, you're either a patrol officer, or a, you know, that's fairly easy. So. Can I ask a question, Mary? How does, we drop Northampton, but how does Greenfield and Montague play into this? Because they are larger towns with larger budgets and their service model is, is more um, just by virtue of the fact that they're larger right. towns. So how the does fact that, that they that play the data. No, the fact that they play in, you're saying things that would make you think that they pay more than you at the maximum. You pay. That's what I would think. So, no, they don't. Northampton okay. is, it was. They do. Because their department heads are almost like some of your cabinet level positions. You know, you, you have a okay. department head in Northampton, there's five divisions underneath them. So the scope is so different. But in Montague, just because they're wealthy, you actually pay better in a, in a lot of positions. So you're in the market with the rest of those. So there is no, and again, it, it's, you do not have a concern other than at the minimum pay. The minimum piece of it is really the right. biggest problem. Right. Which I think because, we had talked about before. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> look at for example let me just take a peek a gander at now the only position on the maximum pay of all of your titles that is below the maximum of the market and that includes montague that includes all of those except northampton the only position that is below is in fact your recreation director you have a narrow scope of a recreation program okay no, that's not the same as a recreation director. I would never want to lower somebody's title um, if they are, in fact, a department. Um, you know, so that's the only one. Some of your other ones, your library director of all the comparable, you know, is $8 above. Wow. That's $16,000 a year. Your, uh, you know, again... And the reason this is unfair, this is why you have to look at the whole context. The salary for town clerk, treasurer, collector, well, it's $8 above a town clerk, but nearer to the treasurer collector. So the way that you have used people, it, you know, is, is one way. Your senior center director, although yours is regional, right, is only a dollar above the market. So that might tell you why we 
you know, are looking at that range as well, because okay. when you look solely at a title, you're not really looking at some of the others. You're, the assessor, assessors are always tricky. Are they a principal assessor? Is right. Board? So it's unfair to say, oh, your assessor, assistant assessor is $10 more than the market. Well, you don't know what's happening in those other towns. So it really has to do with the groupings within your town that drives these. So you don't want to cherry pick and look at one thing or, or another. You know, your public works positions are much closer to the market than some of your other ones. So I have no concerns over where your people are now at the maximum of their ranges. There's no issue there. We're not looking to cut people's pay and say, oh, you're above, we're going to cut that. No, that's never the purpose of a compensation. We're making that fit our recommendation. And so the other piece of this is changing the job descriptions and really taking the information that came from our questionnaires that came from reformatting or will come from reformatting because they will look different. Um, and we experienced that, you know, a little bit a few weeks ago. Um, but changing that particular thing actually will, the intent is always to help refine what the duties are at the time you do the compensation study. Um, because then it allows you to compare in the market, but also compare in internally. So that part of this, are you, did you see a lot of difference in the job description transition? Not much. That's what I mean. Your structure, clearly you had a consultant do these job descriptions the last right. time they were done. So they are, they are in decent shape. I think what went awry with all due respect, um, is the inconsistent way the salary plans have been created, modified, whatever, since, since that time. I've, I've, ver I've done about 70 of these and probably only one other had a 50% range. So 5% steps. So I do think that your structure is good. The job descriptions needed some updating. We understand that we want to go back to the format of having, making it look the same with the, the heading and the FLSA and the department. You know, that's just a formatting issue of having who the person reports to. Um, but they were not in horrible shape. Some of it had to be updated uh, in terms of, computer technology versus typewriter or, or things like that. And some functions have shifted over time, you know. Doing and so that was the thing I was going to ask yeah. you is how much of a shift anecdotally, how much of a shift do you stood out to you? Um, well, everybody was wearing so many hats before there weren't really that many shifts. I think where we saw the most was an undervaluing of the work being done. For example, and I know that the town is dealing with maybe a, a community-wide outreach social worker. Your outreach worker- That question, yeah. Center, you know, was being paid like it was a clerical position. That's just not accurate. Somebody who's doing case management, working with families, that's at a higher, higher level position. Some of your assistant, quasi assistant department heads, you know, your assistant treasurer, you have, you know, an assistant town clerk, they have real statutory authority. So the job descriptions now capture that, which okay. I think were lacking in the past, you know. And also, you know, we had to tweak some of the ADA requirements of what are the physical skills needed for a job, you know, what are the. Okay functions, but overall, the descriptions were not in bad shape. Okay. Cause I needed to know that just from an ADA coordinators coordinators yes. perspective, yep. but also I do know that there was a statutory, um, need to identify. Yeah. Those, those because, positions, because of right, that. right. Raloon, Christina Johnson, who's the senior center director is here. She's got her hand up. Hi. Um, 
Well, first, uh, actually, two questions. Um, I guess, so Casey, I, I'm one of the department heads that hasn't been spoken to yet about, um, you know, the, the survey, um, I'm sorry, the job description, Mary, that you and your team created. Because if, if I remember talking, you said that you were gonna create that and then send it back to us for feedback. And, I, and nobody in our department has received that back yet, so. So Christina, they haven't been, they haven't been completed right no we had some questions come up with another department that slowed down that process yep, so no, once fine. i get them they will go out um and also i wanted to clarify that um your your description of the outreach coordinator is exactly how personally i would want it to be but that was not how it was so it was more like an administrative assistant position. So, um, you know, you were you were saying how case management and this and that. Um, yes, that's what we really need. <laughs> um, but that wasn't an, that's not an accurate description of what the position was. Mm -hmm. So, when you get the draft, we'll mark it up and we'll you know one of the processes is to make sure that we've got the job description accurate. Yep. It reflecting the internal equity in terms of, of pay. I don't want to specifically talk about individual positions tonight, only because I don't have the individual uh, questionnaires in front of me right now. But uh, when you get the drafts, which will be, um, we're almost done with them this week, and we can follow up if there's any outstanding or uh, egregious sort of misrepresentations. My in bringing up the senior center in particular is that we often find, uh, with all due respect, they are sometimes the poor stepchild of you know a municipality uh, in terms of you know the work that gets done there. So uh, we'll look at that carefully when we get you the draft. Okay, thank you. So, so Mary, bef yeah. before, I don't have any other questions about the presentation. I was, I just wanted to reiterate to the, to the group that I have you scheduled for May 5th to talk to the select board. And one of the reasons was that trying to discern the path forward in terms of funding for the compensation plan for next fiscal year. Um, one of the things that's on this agenda for the personnel board is to start to discuss the, the, or to go back to the COLA discussion, because as you said, the steps have a pretty wide range, but step 10, we have about, I want to say 12 people that are at step 10 in their various ranges. Mm -hmm. So those people, I'm concerned about if we, if we were to wait to transition till next year, um, I'm concerned about that from a management perspective that we capture as, as many people that are, that, that fall within the parameters of, of the changes in our pay rate, the pay for this year, last mm -hmm. year, everyone got a um, a step and a cola. And so now that we have some idea that we're looking at four to 5% between steps, that's really very expensive. And this has come up at the finance committee meeting, three meetings in a row, because the concern that was voiced to me by a couple members of the finance committee was that this was um, not sustainable. And so moving, spreading those ranges out, dropping the first three steps and spreading the ranges out because the high end of that range of the current classification plan or compensation plan is market value. Mm -hmm. Spreading the percentages out makes sense, but I don't know that we can pivot that quickly. So I asked the personnel board about 
cola for those 12, I think it's 12 people. I can't remember all the names off the top of my head. Um, but there's a few people in each department. So my, here's what I can do. And this comes back to the policy issue. So one scenario that you could imagine in the world, according to Mary, again, a happy place is instead of maybe you have a transition time, maybe you say, we're going to give a two and a half percent cola and only a two and a half percent step so that everybody gets the two and a half and those who were going to get the 5%, it's almost like giving them a step, but no cola, you know, so you could do okay. like that so that they're not being cheated, but then also, but your people at max are going to be at max anyways. And you may want to make it be a 2% or 1%, two and a half and two and a half is healthy. You know, that's, so physically though, this is one thing that is unique to Deerfield. Deerfield always has a grid. That's that compensation plan that I sent you is the grid that gets voted. And people are not comfortable with change. I am the first to tell you, okay. I don't like change myself. So what we would need to do is make a significant change, not only in the plan itself, but also in all of these budgets. And I'm fairly sure that my town accountant is going to um, not be very happy with me. So I've prepared her for this eventuality in the event that it were to nope. happen. <laughs> here's, but here's, here's that's, an up, that's a lift for us. Okay, here's a question. No, I, I get it. And because you do want the grid to be created. So in the report, I've created your grid with two and a half percent steps right? Correct. What you're talking about is now let me ask the question. So the finance committee, the personnel board and town meeting need to decide what is our target increase for employees? Is, is it a total of two and a half percent or is it two and a half across the board plus a, a COLA? So what you could do and, and not adjust the pay scale by a COLA, just add a new step 11, because the salary data you're looking at is not across the off. increased by 2% in July. Okay. So maybe you have a new step for those at 10 who haven't gotten one in a while, you make it 10.5, shift everyone one and give everybody a step. It's two and a half across the board. Across the board. Because no, and again, all due respect to anybody who's on this call, except for those who might be at steps one through four, which are not many, if I recall. Right, there's only a few. More people at step 10 than there are at steps one through four, that's for sure. So why not just give everybody a step, convert it to two and a half for July one, get it over with and just okay. everybody two and a half, a two and a half percent step and readjust where the schedule is. We can maybe play with some scenarios this week if you'd like to do that, because I think that might be the cleanest in terms of approving it. And if we in fact shift from my 4.5 to the five and we add a new 10, which is gonna be the 10 and a half, so to speak, then you're adjusting the scale for FY22 that takes into account the market and the COLA and Correct. move everybody the two and a half. And then you just did. If it, and so the affordability factor, it sounds like to me, you're the gonna, affordability, it's, it, it's much fine. wider. You're fine. It's across the board for everybody as opposed to, and not everybody might like it because, but what everybody that's an employee needs to understand is there's some real questions on the part of a major decision-making committee that this is not going to be sustainable for the way it is for the next several years. And so we have to make some tough decisions for the betterment of the entire community, including the employees, because think, it's got to be yeah. sustainable. I think you are better served in a funding sense, in a budgeting sense, in a fairness sense, equity, because if you're at max and people are getting 7%, because they're getting a COLA plus 
you know, right. um, and you're getting the 2%. Your equity is definitely skewed. You know, but you're not below the market at the higher end. So And I so that's the piece that they won't understand. But those of us that are sitting here seeing those numbers have a better grasp on. I think the one question you may see is, can you explain the blank spaces in the tables that you showed us? You explained it to me. I've seen it more than once, but it may be that we have to, to drill down to that a little bit later. Um, sure, because the blank spaces are, there wasn't enough data points for the title that you have. But what is most important is that grid of one through seven or A through G. It's the internal equity, because even though there's blanks, if we've decided, that Mary and Casey are in the same group, there's enough data points to come up with that range. And quite honestly, it's not any different than your current structure, which is why I think we just add a grade seven and go with your current structure and divide it okay. up and it out a little. With bit. that spread. Yeah. Okay. Christina? <laughs> Uh, for, yeah, for the record, as an employee perspective, um, I think it's going to be a tough sell to change that for July, because I know personally, I've already been counting on the raise that I was going to be getting and from the step, um, meaning that <laughs> I've been borrowing money to make car payments until July, when I'll finally have enough money to make my car payments. So it's just so the flip of that, Christina, is the question that finance committee asked the last two meetings, which is the town's requirement under prop two and a half is two and a half percent. The the way that the current compensation plan is created, it doesn't recognize that. And I can't change how it was before, but from an equity perspective the whole purpose of doing the compensation study was to, term, was to determine where we fit in the market so that we can better serve the community and the employees. And so I hear what you're saying. And this is why I'm probably gonna be, I'll get hate mail. But the point is, is we've got to balance both those things. And last year, if you recall, there were a lot of towns that did not get any increase and Deerfield did. So, what we're looking at in terms of funding availability for all our programs and all our services is a real need to tighten our belts. We have no capital money. We are barely at the point where, where there's some tough decisions that finance the select board and capital are gonna have to make. And so we're at that point where if we can't do certain things, we're looking at having to scale back services which makes it a heck of a lot more difficult to explain to town meeting um, what they what they can assist us with by voting for these budgets. So that's that's okay. that's Casey, a tough that's place where everybody is. Casey, Your point. I'm just I'm just thinking that it just doesn't to kind of reverse on what people are counting on two months ahead. With only two months ahead. Yeah, but you're not losing money, Christina. I think that's a that's a point that everyone needs to remember. This is a, just because the expectation is five percent doesn't mean it's going to be there. The finance committee could recommend no raises at all. I don't think they would, um, but that happened in several communities. So, from a an equity perspective, Deerfield this past year didn't suffer, but the towns around us did. And so there's a balance that has gotten to be struck because you're looking at across the board in the, the schools, each school budget is going up somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 4%. And that's with significant cuts on their part. And schools do not have to follow two and a half. Right. So from a budgeting perspective, you know, we're doing the best we can to keep everybody solvent and everybody in their jobs. Casey, could I, you know, I don't like to get into individual positions. Right. And this isn't about one person. This is no, about but the, what's, the whole compensation study. I do appreciate, and I, and I have mentioned twice now, um, Council on Aging. And just so Christina knows, she's below step four. She's going to be brought up. And in fact, if you look at the report, we have recommended, that's one position we have moved up a grade. So. Christina, my friend, I think you're going to be okay. And we can okay. talk about it off screen. And 
because if you read the report, you'll see that your position has been moved up and you would not be, my understanding is you're either at step three or step four now, and we're yeah. recommending that those would be dropped from the scale. So on a personal note, don't cancel, don't refinance your car. And, um, you know, this is why we need to do it as a systematic approach because to, uh, this is where I will say out loud, um, for your pay to be around $25 an hour is egregious. And um, we have corrected that in our recommendations. My, so that's the good oh, news. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Mary, can I ask a question for purposes of helping the, the committee and the member of the select board that's very nicely joined us? I'm, Carolyn must have had another issue. Um, but... I think if we could do that cost analysis with the town accountant and have yeah. an answer for sure. Then you can the wrap fifth, your brain around it. Then, I, then, we, then we can say to them, look, this is the option. This is the other option. This is how we need to proceed. Um, because again, I do think it, it is worth noting that we have more people at step 10 than we do at the first four steps on the current compensation step plan. Right, right. And... Um, Yes, that's very true. But most of your people are uh, somewhere, in the middle. somewhere in the middle. It's like five, six. So they're they're going to be. But which may be why, when we do the cost analysis, we may say, do the step and increase the scale by one percent. So then the people who were going to be at five or at three and a half, and the ones who are going to be at ten are at three and a half. You know, because that still will be more cost effective than the majority of people getting five. So it's right. And, and, but they also have a longer range to grow. And so yes. that's a piece that. Yeah, I think we Having looked the at numbers, these a lot, I know yeah. that you, you want to keep that range to grow as well, because it's not only a mechanism to retain your employees and help them grow into their positions more effectively, but also it's longevity to some and extent you have to of the people. position. I mean, right. your pay scale. It's harder to recruit than it is to retain. You know, $13 an hour. You know, granted, the town is a great employer. You have benefits, you have pensions, you have all of those things, but a gallon of milk is still $3. Right. Oh, so. Um, and Christina still has to make her car payment, coming so I out. get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. I, be, I will I stop asking plan. questions and I will talk to you about getting this done with the accountant. Sort yeah, because I think we just do this grid. I'll give a sample. And then the only thing is, is when are people's, when do they get their increases on a step date or a July 1? July 1. Okay, so that Subsequent makes it a lot to easier. approval by town meeting. Okay, great, great. But we are finalizing the budget and I would. Oh, you muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it, it, my mouse is not behaving. Um, and I need to let the personnel board know that Skip actually asked me why we hadn't voted a compensation plan back in December. And I honestly, that, that wasn't on my radar screen because I knew we needed to address a lot of this compensation study or the class classification compensation study. So he kind of um, brought home the fact that I should have marshaled that with you more and more quickly. But for purposes of planning, when we sent the memo out to everybody about the compensation that they could expect, that they should be planning for in their budgets, um, that determination, we hadn't revised a compensation plan. And so he, he basically said to me, you know, you should have had that ready. Well, we didn't have all the information we thought we were going to have. So I think if we can do that cost analysis, the, the issue that the, the finance committee is going to have is if we make changes, they're going to have to revisit some of these budgets. And so John can attest to the fact that they will be grumpy about it. Mm -hmm. um, but we do need to make some tough decisions, particularly since I did hear quite a bit of quite a few questions about the 
sustainability of our current compensation plan that I think if we do have to make some tough decisions, it's not without, it's not outside the realm of possibility to have to make them now. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think actually having the scenario costed out will either make people make a decision to do it a little differently or feel better about what it looks like. So right. I, I think without the visual and the, the real hard numbers, um, you know, and you don't want to, and to Christina's point, um, you know, save money on the backs of people who thought they were getting an increase, you know. So, and so that's, that's, and that's what we what need to saying. show. Yeah, exactly. We need to show exactly. what that analysis looks like. Right. And I need the accountant to understand it and to work with us on it because she physically does the data inputs into the budget programs right. for that. All right. Well, you and I, I should really just come out and see you. Beautiful weather now. Yes. John, <laughs> does that satisfy some of the questions that you think the finance committee is going to have? Maybe John can't answer me. I'll ask him offline. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I had muted. There were, um, I really have no idea. I We've just been doing the budgets based on the current salary schedule uh, right. without giving a thought to what Mary's doing. So, I mean, I don't know how difficult it would be to go back and change all the budgets. I guess that would be actually a question that goes to Brenda. Yeah, I want to talk to Brenda, but I want Brenda to to understand Mary's perspective and my perspective. And, you know, I'll certainly share what Christina said because it's completely valid. I get that. Um, I'm just trying to balance the needs of the residents with the needs of the employees. And the frankly, the difficult financial position that most of the towns are finding themselves in, and Deerfield's no different. So from a, a long-term perspective, I think we need to at least address the fact that we know we need to make adjustments and see how we can do that in the least painful way possible. But John was at the finance committee meetings. So that's why I asked him. No, that's great. <laughs> there, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about wages. Right, because, because we had plugged because, in certain numbers. Well, the town vote at the last town meeting, the town, the people of the town voted the current salary schedule. And that's Correct. all we and that's all we have to go on. And um, now that we have some information, I think it makes it easier for us to make some different, <coughs> excuse me, some decisions that can be helpful for everyone. So people aren't losing their employees, but the town is um, we're recognizing the residents limitations and the prop two and a half limitations that we have. Right. Does Mary want to go away now? Are you kidding? <laughs> never, never. But it sounds like we're done for tonight. So I will go. Okay. Um, so I will send you an email in the morning. And yeah, let's regroup you tomorrow. Set up a meeting with Brenda. Because if the spreadsheet I have is accurate, which I believe that it is, particularly since it's, I now know their step increases are July, I'll do a quick scenario at implementing the two and a half. And then you may want to say, you know, for this year, because people are already prepared their budgets, let's do the two and a half COLA. And, you, you know, so people are getting their 5%, because you're right, there's no guarantee of a COLA, but they can count on their step increase, because that is voted, the whole system is voted. And then maybe those at, um, you know, get that extra step of two and a half, and you have a transition year to get it in place. Because, you know, you have value. I need to see, we need to see what the numbers look like. Right. So we'll do that. Because we need to see what's affordable. I know how much money we don't have. Well, you're off. The <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right, right I'm going to go and let you all chat, and I'll be in touch I soon. A, I have a question. Oh yeah. The the two and a half coal, or I understand how you're using it in context of um, current wage scale, but the real cost of living is 
quite Absolutely. a bit below that. And are right. we setting a, would we be setting a bad precedence by giving a cola that's higher than reality? Well, you bring up an excellent point, and and people misuse the term cola. And um, so, what many places do is they give the step, and then or they say we guarantee everybody a minimum of a certain amount combination cola and step. So the the good news is if you go to a smaller step, you can control that a little more, because if if the cola is half a percent and you've been giving 5% for a step, you know, you could still afford more easily a two and a half percent step and a true CPI adjustment. Which I think is one and a half, isn't it? Not even. Um, so those are the 1. decisions you have to make. But I think when yes. we have numbers of as is without any cost of living increase, you can then back into the, okay, we're going to implement this plan. Now let's look at the CPI, let's look at a cola. Because the CPI, when I looked at the CPI back in January, it was 1.4. And so yeah. I had initially had this conversation with the personnel board and with the select board. And then when you and I talked, you said, well, hold off and let's see what the data looks like. Right, because and if people, and again, this sounds personal. If the salary ranges are above the market, do you need the cola? Exactly. I, I think exactly. We'll run some numbers. That's the and tougher take a look question. At it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All, All right. right. So let's let's we'll crunch some numbers and Goodbye, I'll talk my to friends. you in the morning. All right. Thank yeah. you, Mary. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank, thank you, Mary. Clear as mud. Yeah. <laughs> so I tried to, I looked at the agenda before she left and I wanted to ask the question because if we can have something prepared by the fifth, that's the cost analysis. Um, yes, John, it won't be ready for tomorrow. Um, but if we can update that cost analysis, we'll have a better ability to make a longer term decision, I think. And again, I know I'm going to get hate mail. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. <laughs> it's the whole purpose of being the town administrator so they can throw darts at you. <laughs> so let me just quick look at the agenda. Raloon, do you have the agenda yeah, in front I do. of you? I have the agenda up and the, the next thing, look, hold on, let me just switch over to this, my other uh, window here. Um, so we were going to talk about the minutes, which is easy and, and relatively brief. Um, we were going to talk about the community social worker outreach position, and we were we were going to discuss the proposed COLA for the new fiscal year. Maybe not, and, and you know, to begin to discuss it. Maybe not not vote on it, but just introduce that topic, which has already been pretty well introduced. Um, how are how are, how are we doing on time? Do we want to try to? I'm not sure how long. Did you want to start with talking about the the social work position? Um, Casey, Why don't you guys do your, your minutes? Why don't you guys okay. do the minutes? Do the quick functional stuff. Okay. So let I know Lisa shared the minutes today. I was working and didn't get a chance to take a look at it yet, to be honest. Um, Can I just interrupt a minute? I mean, there seems like there are people here that are just waiting for this agenda item. And could we do the community social outreach position first so that they can... Social worker. Outreach. I have an update. <laughs> well, they can leave because they don't really need to be here for us talking about the minutes or the, the cola. So, sure. um, so I actually talked to Mary about that when it first came up. And in the meantime, I had some conversations with one of the community health organizations around us. Um, the acronym is sitting in front of my eyes, but I cannot remember the, what it means. Um, and so there's, and what I talked to Mary about was there's a social worker and there's also a community outreach coordinator or community services coordinator. They're different positions. They have different levels of responsibility and they have different expectations and also liability. So one thing that Mary had given me when she first looked at that was Acton's community services coordinator position which is not a social worker's position. It's, it's, it's a, 
more, more than an outreach coordinator, sort of geared, it's a support position that includes behavioral health elements, but isn't, doesn't require the licensure of a social worker. And then there's the social worker, which has very specific requirements. And, you know, the conversation around that to some extent is the town has to take into account several things. How would we pay for these positions? Um, the purpose of the positions and how they're deployed. We know that we have needs in the senior community. Um, it's been brought up in several meetings that there are needs in that would that have been discovered throughout COVID. But one thing and one reason I spoke to the community health organization was they already have these positions. They call it a community health worker, I think. They have a position that works in a similar manner and they have it through the jail. So it's a collaborative memorandum of understanding between the jail and community health for the let it's Allie's it's Allie. does, anybody, does anybody know who Allie is it's PhD it yeah I think so it's out of Greenfield it's Allie for, development yes yeah, Center for Human Development it's either Center that's for it. Human Development or a CSO CHG okay yeah that's where I used to work CHC okay. I think which is the um which is the nonprofit um, mental health agency that now is contracting with our town and many other towns to provide social worker for the police that's department? That's CSO. That's CSO. That's CSO. CSO, yeah. Okay, so this, this would be the community health group um, uh, that would provide this, this basically community health worker. And so I discussed it with Allie and Allie had a lot of insight because they had been working with the jail through a through this um, contract that they have to provide outreach services for inmates transitioning out of the jail. And there's a variety of needs these folks have. And so it really kind of fits the model that was explained to me. Um, the issue is, is we are not sure. And, and I have to say, part of this is a funding question. We are not sure where the funding is gonna come from. We don't know that we would be able to bill insurance, particularly for a community services or health worker um, function. Whereas a licensed social worker, there is a funding mechanism for through insurance. Although the town does not have that expertise. So I have to say, we don't have that expertise. The closest we have for a billing model is what we do with EMS and they contract with a billing group. So there's still some questions about this. And what was I was asked about this in terms of perhaps utilizing grant money as a sort of a startup function. We are not sure whether ARPA funds will cover that. I think there may be access through the entire ARPA program itself, but it may not be direct to the town. We're not sure yet. We're waiting for US Treasury to come down with their interpretation of the bill itself and they haven't provided it. In fact, I sent out a bunch of information that was essentially the slideshow to two of the meetings I went to last week about this. So there's still some questions and I don't know that, especially based on my conversation with the select board last week, I don't know that we're ready, ready to say go and put this into the compensation plan because we don't, with things are so in the air, we don't know enough information to hit the trigger, or to pull the trigger on that, for lack of a better term. Um, I don't mean that to be an insulting term. It's just what came into my head quickly. So there, there's just enough questions that I'm not sure about it. Does that, does anybody else? Christina, let me just ask a quick question. Mm -hmm. I think, once I have more information, once we have some interpretation, I think we could get some help from the feds, but I'm really concerned about the, the long-term um, ability to provide for this, this position or these positions without a dedicated funding source. And so 
because a, for a small town like Deerfield, you know, that could be a stress. We're trying to manage the fact that we need to leave 300 some odd thousand dollars on the table for free cash for next year. And we're running up, and this is without capital, we are running right up against that number right now. And so Carolyn would tell me, we don't know that yet, but we also don't know about the federal money. So, Christina? <laughs> And I'm sorry, I'm t I know I'm talking a lot, but I never talked in front of the personnel board. So um, speaking of positions, um, so along with what Casey's talking about, I've also just wanted to make it clear, um, and I've said this to Casey, that um, uh, we had an outreach coordinator. I mean, we discussed it with, uh, you know, when we we're talking about the positions, the rate chart. Um, and now we don't. Um, and I would love, I mean, I would love to have a more robust, if you want to call it, that position in that role. I really would. But also part of that role, um, it is a lot, there is a, a lot sort of administrative about it. And now here at the center, I mean, I'm 40 hours and I'm here every day but the only other employee is 15 hours a week. And again, the prior outreach coordinator, and this doesn't mean anything about the hours, but she was 12 hours a week. So it's not like she was full time either, but there was someone here Monday through Friday for part of the day besides me. And we, and we do notice the difference, <laughs> I mean, I, this isn't supposed to sound insulting, but it's almost like needing a body that, you know, another body there. So I just wanted to put, I just wanted to put that out to you guys since you're the personal board and, um, and it will be interesting to see how that works in with, you know, what, what um, Casey and Carolyn and are, are talking about these other two positions because, um, well, I, I guess, I mean, my, why I talk so much is I always, I just want to make sure we're not forgotten. <laughs> no, actually, I was waiting for the job description. I want to see what they have for the job description, Christina. Mm. Okay. For the outreach coordinator that we, or the outreach person we have right now. Yeah. The, the position we have approved through the compensation plan okay. right now. So it's not like I've forgotten. I was waiting. No, I did, well, it wasn't insinuating, but just in general. I mean, it's my, obviously my job to, uh, remind, you know, to put that information out there, what we, our needs and stuff. And it does, and I also recognize it doesn't mean we get everything we need. I certainly know that. So, sorry. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Megan. Hi, thanks so much. I will try not to take up too much time, but, um, I'm a Deerfield resident and a clinical social worker and part of the group um, that had been sort of thinking about a community social worker and the needs of the community and how this might really benefit our town. And so in just hearing, you know, some of the concerns, which I think are really important and valid of how do you pay for this? What are the needs? How do you pay for it? Yeah, I can say that just myself as a clinician and speaking with other clinicians in the area and in conversation with Chief Pachorek, I think the needs are really significant. I think there's a youth mental health crisis that has been really exacerbated by COVID. I think it was pre-existing COVID, but whether I talk to clinicians or, you know, nurses down at Bay State who are now, you know, medical units, inpatient you know, youth medical units are now warehousing 80% psychiatric cases for kiddos and teens because they just have nowhere to put them. And so I know in speaking with other community members, families are also calling 20 to 25 therapists trying to find clinicians for their children or adolescents. And so I do think that there's a real crisis that we might not be seeing every day, but I think is going to continue to um, take place and potentially worsen if we're not thinking about a mental health response the way we're thinking almost about a vaccination response. And so I think in some of the research that we've done in talking to community social workers is that hiring an independently licensed clinician 
can mean that those folks bill insurance companies directly. I don't know how that kind of works if they're also a town employee, but That's I bill the insurance problem. companies all the we time. We don't know what I that just, looks like. Yeah, so we would so be there's happy a liability to do research. for the town as well. And that's another investigative right. point that we're looking into. Um, we could definitely. One thing I will say is that. there is a separate, there could be a separate grant process out there for that. In fact, I yep. saw it. It's in, um, it's in information on ARPA. It is not part of dedicated direct funding to towns. And so that was what I was trying to parse out for this conversation mm -hmm. today is it's specific to youth. There's, there's various pots of money and I can point you to that if you want to send me an email. There's various yeah. pots of money. And I think a lot of these community health organizations um, can utilize it as well. It's just my, my chief concern right now is how do you meet the heavy lift that it's going to be for a town to onboard something like this without knowing about yep. a dedicated funding source, the yep. liability question answering the liability questions and being yep. able to implement something in without all the information you need from the feds and the state to interpret right. the 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 bills i can see what the description says but fundamentally yep. i don't know what that's going to look like nobody does and so those as an administrator those are the things that immediately sit on my radar screen um, because, you know, I noticed it myself. I know people that couldn't find clinicians that really needed help that are not youth, but just people like me. Yeah. Right. So Adults the need well. is definitely there. I totally agree with you. I just yep. don't know how to implement it without more answers. So we have, con we've, our group has um, made contact with a number of other social workers, community social workers, mainly out in Eastern Mass. And you know some of those communities do do are a bit wealthier than ours, but they have said that those um, clinicians have been able to help access all that grant funding, whether it's youth substance abuse prevention, you know, or like there's these different funding sources that other communities have then been able to really work at that, and so that over time, as that individual is established and you know, is familiar with all these different kind of pockets of money that they've been able to bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars through these grant opportunities. So I do think it's a position that over time could bring in more and more money into the community. Um, and then we can absolutely ask about that liability question because I get that that's also an issue. Um, but that's we also have to why... run this through our own insurance companies as well. We have to see what they say. And right. I put the question out there, but we didn't, it, it's still sort of a holding pattern, which I know makes people uncomfortable. Yep. Uncertainty yeah. Uncertainty is and one it, thing that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Yeah, of course. And so I think that as we're, as our group is thinking about pushing for um, more of a professional clinical position, that it feels like then there would be more opportunity for whether it, that's insurance payments or that person has a skill set that would help them then access that grant funding, you know, writing grants, et cetera, uh, grant applications, et cetera. So that's kind of how we're envisioning it. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I don't want to take up a lot of time because I know you have others. Raloon has one. I do, I do. Um, Great. I mean, I, I totally agree that it's a it's a huge need. I mean, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with that more. I'm I'm sort of trying to wrap my head around what like what what that position would look like in terms it, it feels I and maybe I just need some more specifics to understand better like kind of what their job would be in as yep. based in the town. And and then my other, I'm just kind of curious. You've you've maybe you already said it and I missed it, but you said something like our group is recommending this. I'm wondering what mm what group that is that you're referring to? Yeah, so um, um, I'm a part of the Deerfield Inclusion Group and there's a subcommittee within that on public safety and local governance. And so we've been looking just at issues of public safety, public health, and trying to sort of put our heads together. Like, you know, obviously this is up in, in terms of the pandemic, but before that, right, like, our country does not handle mental health well. Our mental health system is really broken. And so we were just noticing how um, 
all these issues have just been exacerbated by the pandemic and talking to Chief Pechorek, right? There's, there's really vulnerable, mentally ill community members that are really kind of overutilizing police, right? And that's, that's a problem, right? Both for the, the police department and trying to respond to this, I think they try to do it really skillfully and thoughtfully, but folks are needing care and having difficulty accessing treatment. So as we envision the job function, it's a little bit of a jack of all trades in terms of what community social work is, but there's a lot of different components. There's this outreach component, helping people um, access services. So maintaining referral lists. Okay, who has an opening for children? Who has an opening for adolescents? Who has an opening for seniors? building those relationships and then helping individuals and families really access those services. I think some crisis intervention is really critical. So either there's a community level crisis, for instance, when tragically that young man was killed in a, that car accident, uh, you know, a few months ago, that community social worker can say, okay, what do you need me to do? How do I help the community in response to this community level tragedy? That person, um, could help, you know, there are really vulnerable periods of time when somebody gets out of a hospitalization or a higher level of care or a detox treatment, where if they don't have support during this critical period, it's really hard for someone to continue making the gains that they've made. And so that community social worker could say, hey, let's meet a few times before your next course of treatment starts. Um, in other communities, that community social worker will do one-off parent interventions where a parent's come in pulling their hair out. And so they basically sort of have office hours, right? And a parent can come in and say, I'm struggling with this. Um, community social workers can also help do more community-wide prevention efforts, whether that's around substance abuse prevention, suicide prevention, violence prevention. So we're thinking about it as there's a clinical piece, there would be referral and case management piece. And I know there's maybe some other positions that might be doing that. And then kind of a community health and prevention and wellness piece. Um, and so I think that having an experienced clinician, highly trained clinician that can kind of hold the complexity of these different roles would be ideal. Um, and to keep hire and keep someone that would stay and that is highly trained because it, you know, it's, a, it's challenging. It's a challenging role. Does that help? Yeah, no, that does. That helps a lot. And I, I know, I know we were talking a little bit about sort of the, the, when we listened to Mary, we were talking about the department heads and sort of the structure within the town of sort of, and I'm, I'm wondering sort of what umbrella it would fall under. Would it be this person, you know, would they, would they be associated with some other group or would it they be sort of another person just at the town hall? I, I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around how it would what how it would actually play out. So right. if I remember correctly, there's I think the police department has a contract with CSO or will be starting a contract with CSO for, for social worker support. Um, the reason I had discussed um, the community services, like the community health worker type, and that's more of an outreach role, but just for purposes of discussion, the reason I had discussed a contract situation is so that it gives the town an idea of what the ramifications of implementing this over a period of time could be. The CSO contract is also a way to measure results as you start something up because I don't know that we have the resources to go from zero to a hundred like that. Um, and so I think, wasn't that one of the reasons that CSO was, that was coordinated, Megan? Oh, Annalie, you wanna well, jump in? I think also the, the two positions, the CSO coordination through the police department would be working with them on a crisis basis. That's on, exactly. That's, so they would be able to respond uh, if something happened at two in the morning, while the position that we're talking about here for more of the community access would be pretty much a Monday through Friday position. 
and I think would work could work really closely with that crisis clinician to say, okay, you, you did that two in the morning eval. That person is not hospitalized. What kind of follow up would be appropriate? You know, how could I support them to then access partial hospitalization or whatever the next step is? Um, and that that it's both crisis intervention in the moment, and then hopefully a little bit more case management, you know, relationship building, crisis prevention, making sure that people, right, find a therapist that's willing to meet them, for instance, or, you know, whatever the case may be. We're trying, we're trying to take people, I have my waiting list is so long. It's really yeah. bad, but I, I think yeah. it's great. I think the thing to know about this, you're talking about, it can bring in money. I think the other thing is it's so hard to like quantify how much money this saves having this type of position because you're interrupting DCF involvement. You're interrupting, you know, kids leaving the school. We lose $20,000 every time somebody leaves Frontier or whatever it is, you know, um, that's from our town budget that just goes away when those kids, you know, move away or don't, you know, they go are have to be sent to a therapeutic school somewhere. Like it's, it's, it, I mean, we could probably find the 45, 50, 60, whatever grand it starts at, you know, you could figure out how much, how, and even in Pachura could probably talk about how many calls he goes on and how much he has to pay overtime to his, people to like go to houses in the middle of the night. I mean, it's really, it's an interesting thing in terms of when we're talking budget. And I think this is what's hard for a lot of people to always think about is prevention, right? Every drug overdose in our town that with the ambulance in the South County, I mean, and the EMT is being paid, you know, it's just, there's so much that could be saved through this prevention kind of position, um, which is a way we can think about talking about it with the, the money folk <laughs> too, you know, which, cause it's important. It's important to figure that out, but I think it's, it's a, I mean, and I also think we have really good, we have really good, um, a couple of really good counselors and health teachers at Frontier who would probably also be working closely with this person um, and at the schools. And I, I think it's, it's a great proposal. It's just like Casey said, it's just figuring it out, you know? It's well, I think we also need to recognize that we need outreach as well not just this we have we we did have an outreach person through the senior center and that person can't be completely gone we need that we need that element and so you're talking about two different jobs and can the town afford two different jobs because the skill level is completely different in both those positions the minute you are a licensed social worker you're at a different level um, i've worked with one for years so i have a, a an understanding of what that means. So I think we need to balance what, what, and this is me speaking not only as an individual, but as a town administrator, part of my job is to find a way to make all these things work. Um, I think there needs to be some recognition that we do need that current community services coordinator backbone as, as a support mechanism because not everything falls within the purview not every support thing falls within the purview of the social worker. There's there's a different, there are two, in my mind, there are two different things because I see what the outreach coordinator used to do versus the kind of services that not only did I have friends who had needed help with, but couldn't find for the exact reasons that you guys are talking about. So I see that that there's, there's a there's a reason to consider it, but from my perspective, there's there's so many elements of unknown out there that it's difficult for me to say, you know, do this right now because there's a lot of things that have to be managed between now and go. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm just letting people know that there are some questions. I mean, we can't hire a person unless we have funding. The bylaws preclude it. My my question though is because my understanding of this type of position. Um, a community social worker, right? Somebody who's trained in community social work is that they're not just clinical. They are also doing outreach. They're also doing, they're, they're like you said, referring to other people. So I think maybe the thought of social worker gets very much thought of as clinical, like the type of work that maybe I'm doing or Megan, it sounds like you're doing weekend, you know, yeah. but this, it would be more of a position that could encompass, it sounds like outreach 
education prevention programs, this is not someone who would be doing sessions or leading groups particularly. So that looks right. like a different that thing from a, from a municipal, and this is why I asked Mary Accardi the question. This looks different from a municipal perspective if you're, a, if you're looking at jobs, if you're comparing duties and jobs. It, social worker, though that term says something in a job. Outreach coordinator, or community services coordinator looks completely different. So you're mm -hmm. not looking at the same level of job if you're looking at job descriptions because I specifically asked that question. I was concerned about it because when you're trying to put this into the framework that we discussed earlier in the meeting, which is a new compensation plan, we have to be able to fit these things together with what is being created. And that's the other piece, you know, just fundamentally working through um, changes to the library adult circulation position in the middle of a compensation study is difficult because it's not necessarily what was anticipated when you started the study. And so it means that you're, you're sort of trailing behind what the intent was. You've already got everything sort of packaged. It's hard to, to place something else in there that, that really wasn't contemplated. So, you know, that, that was a piece that I thought about, which was why I called Mary. I said, okay, I don't know what this looks like. Tell me what, you, what you've experienced. And so Acton had a services coordinator position that, that looks, it doesn't have the licensure piece. It has a lot of elements of support and outreach and coordination, but the requirement for knowledge and education is not a, a, the clinical licensure. So per, it, it functions a little bit differently. And so that's what I'm trying to really get to is there's, there's different functions and we need to be cognizant of that because again, we have to take it to town meeting. And if we're gonna take it to town meeting, we really have to have everything set up to go. Um, yeah. If we don't have the funding, it by default, you have to have the funding settled before you can ask town meeting to do it. Then it has to go through, we, we would have to fit it somewhere in the compensation study. And so those definitive characteristics that explain what the position's responsibilities and expectations are have to be well-defined. Because guess what? If I don't tell that to you guys now, I will get yelled at by the finance committee later. <laughs> so, what would, so Casey, what, what would you say then the next task is? Because would this be a charge that um, Dig would have to take on doing all this research and and it, isn't this kind of a political issue too because it is it is I'll be honest not so you. much there's, okay there's we're going to find new money it. it's that we're going to save money by well, having here's a the position. thing we need money to start with and one of the things that I said anecdotally and again dartboard um, I, I I will be the target for this but financially one of the charges of my position is to remind people of some of the bad news. And that is we need the structure to be able to support not only the positions we have now, but any growth in positions or changes to positions. And from a town administrator's perspective, it's important to me to balance the economic needs in the community with the economic availability in the community. And so functionally, we need to be able to develop the economic um, development, the economic structure, so to speak, to support more of this work. Because if we don't have that economic structure in place, it's hard to reach out and provide services. It becomes a strain when you've got competing elements in your budget. And frankly, the competing elements, although I, I dislike doing saying it, but functionally the competing elements are the schools and municipal because the schools are not subject to two and a half and the municipal side is. And generally that means that if the economic um, availability to fund positions and to fund projects and to fund ongoing services is strained, it ultimately is gonna hit the residents in the, in the wallet because 
there isn't the support that you might have from having a more robust commercial or retail uh, position. So that is a fundamental, identify the sources, you know, funding sources, what balances the, the tax rate, that sort of thing. And nobody likes to hear me say that, but I have to take those things into account because when somebody comes to me and says, hey, make this happen, I can figure out how to do it. And I don't want people's, I don't, I've experienced this. So in another position where the, econ the economic structure of the community did not lend itself to a lot of growth. And I could see the strain beginning to, to pull from both sides. So what was needed was way up here and what was available was down here. And so there has it, finding that balance is important because it allows the town to provide those services. And so something like this would probably fall under in a different town, a more robust health department to answer that question. That's generally where these things fall. And a more robust health department might have a different structure. So a director that functions in a similar manner as how I function, or as, as Mary said, in the cabinet, like those cabinet positions where you have a variety of skill sets and a variety of responsibility, that person would probably fall within that health structure. And so we don't necessarily have that robust health structure. So that's another challenge to implementing because you need that oversight to really support the position. And so I wouldn't want somebody, I've seen it before where somebody walks through the door and that, that nece isn't necessarily readily available. Functionally, I would like to have it in place first, but that's in a perfect world. I don't know that we're in a perfect world. We're certainly in COVID land still. Um, so those are some of the things that come up for me. And the other piece of this that is useful to understand is the town can contract with another group to, to really develop the service model, to see how it's gonna flow, to determine what, what functionally data is available, to essentially make the case for what is needed in the community. And that's often a first step is contracting for services. That's why we contract for a lot of services through the COG. I think you heard Mary say that one of the financial issues that the town or the one of the functional issues we face on for financial positions in the town is we've got a competing group in the FERCOG accounting program, which skews our evaluation of financial positions in this area because they're taking a very statutorily driven and a precise function out of the comparative value for those positions. So, you know, you've got the ability, on the other hand, it's a good way to, to measure need, to measure how we can implement this over for a retainable period of time, identify funding sources, that sort of thing, sort of build the ability to implement it more effectively um, just by discerning what the need is and how we need to pivot to respond. The schools really have this drilled down better than we do. But like Megan said, this is not necessarily something that this country has handled well for years and years and years. I have two, two thoughts or two questions. So one is you're saying about contracting, you mean something like the police contracting with CSO yes. or us signing a memo, yes. memo of understanding with CHD and having them come in for a period of time, whatever, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So that would be like step one, we get a really- I think that would need. work. I think that would work well for us to just figure out what our needs are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that was one thing that when I did sort of, and really I was trying to get an idea of how Allie made this work with, and or her company may, helps this work with the jail because yeah. this was a new program for them too. They really needed that support, that health support because again, you're transitioning people, everything from housing services to connecting to veteran services to food stamps or, or how, whatever they call it now. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know that. 
um, it's it's that piece of information that doesn't live in my head anymore. <laughs> yeah. Some other information lives in my head. Snap. Yeah. But, Snap. And I find it embarrassing that I can't grab that right now. So I apologize. Um, but that gives us an idea of what we need to define as our needs. Yeah. Because we don't know. I mean, you guys from a clinician perspective understand that better. But from a management perspective and a functional town perspective, I don't. And it's hard for me to explain that to somebody if we don't have real data on the table, especially when it really is a difficult year to throw new things in. Yeah. The other question I had, maybe this is for Megan, it sounds like you've been meeting with Chief Pachurik. It's on, and is that somewhat or? Um, we just had some conversations earlier in the year as they were also thinking about this sort of behavioral health crisis position. Um, and so we were talking about that and looking at different models. And then um, then the group, I'm, the subcommittee that I'm part of sort of started looking more at that community social worker idea in addition to just that sort of behavioral health crisis intervention team, which is taking off all over the country, thankfully. I mean, I think it's a great model. Yeah. So um, yeah, there was some discussion just about um, uh, community members who sounds like, you know, experience persistent chronic mental health issues and um, COVID has exacerbated their, the difficulty in obtaining treatment. And so definitely folks are calling a lot yeah that, definitely that, that it's can, horrible that can be a great ally ship too right I mean when you're saying assessing the need Casey I think there's probably quite a bit of data that Pachorik and his team have and how many more calls they've gotten about you know hopefully they're tracking that data because you can do the math yeah. on that and go whoa we just spent you know 60 grand on you know emergency calls and overtime <laughs> You know, it's just just starting to track that through the police. I think that is where you see a lot of from it. a yeah. I think you see it much more evidently through in from a crisis perspective. It's much harder to discern what the basic need is out there um, on a personal level with folks who are literally melting down because of COVID. I mean, their lives are falling apart, and I understand. It's just I I want to be careful from a management perspective to really help facilitate this so it's effective and can be implemented in the manner that you're describing. Yeah. Because that's and the goal. The goal is to help people. Too. How we do it is important. Yeah. That's great. Lisa, okay. I'm sorry, you had your hand up. Oh yeah. So I'm just saying, so what's the next step that we can say to Megan and besides just, oh, this is, we don't have enough data. So who, how do we get the data? Do they get the data? How does the town meeting come into play and the voters and- So and here's the thing. If we could, that's why I keep saying, if we can sort of figure out what it is we think we might need for both those elements, then we can make a better informed decision to take before you take it to town meeting. Because again, if you're gonna create a position, it has to go into the personnel plan, the compensation plan. It has to have, it has to have gone through the evaluative criteria to create it, um, assigned a qualitative or a, yeah, a qualitative place in the plan. It has to be funded before you can hire for it because the bylaw requires it. So those are the things that are limitations from an administrative perspective. If we had a manual, I would be in a much better place. Oh, and I found you guys somebody to help us with that, by the way. <laughs> so, but anyway, I think right now, before you, before we say we need to throw it someplace, I think we need to know maybe what kind of help we could get, not only from CSO, but what kind of help could we get from maybe CHC and see what they, because that contract concept, I think has worked well for the jail. If it's been in place for almost a year, I think. It might be a little bit more. I don't have it in my email to tell you. For some reason, I can't pull it out of my email. I went looking for it, but the board is also discussing it. And they had a conversation last week at the meeting, at the select board meeting. I'm just trying to remember. I think they wanted to see, and I'll 
check in with Carolyn. She's at the planning board meeting right now, but I think they want to get some idea of what that contract could work like. So from your perspective, you would need to see something. The Megan, was it you that sent the job description? Um, I've been, uh, it probably was Ann Curtis. We've been working okay. together on that and I think she probably sent that in, yeah. So what we would need to do is we're gonna have new job description uh, templates. And I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago when you create a new position, you need to fit it into a template that matches what everybody else's job description is going to be. That's been That's something perfect. of a challenge. So um, we're about to get those templates, but I really do think that this is probably a conversation that personnel board and the select board should have together. Um, and if you wanted to, I could see if we could have this conversation on the fifth when Mary's available. She's going to be presenting information anyway. Um, and like I said, she and I have had some brief conversations. She did look at the job description that Anne probably sent to Carolyn mm -hmm. that Carolyn sent to me. Um, yeah. So she's familiar with that. She's also familiar with what we kind of need for outreach because we still do need some of that just yeah. plain old outreach. Um, yep. And so there's a challenge here. You know, how, if if we can discern what we need for outreach and how we can work with a group of people that's already doesn't have to create the recreate the wheel, they've already got it there. That's a key thing for an effectiveness perspective is if we don't have to recreate the wheel, we're in better shape. It's mm -hmm. also, again, with the contract situation, if we contract, excuse me, if we contract for that, um, not only is the town's liability less, but we also aren't creating the wheel. They, they know how this functions. Yep. And so if we contract for it, we don't have to create a job for it. Um, but I understand mm -hmm. the perspective of having that community social worker available through the town. I mean, other towns do it. Right. Um, it's just, how do we balance the needs? Again, how do we balance the needs of the town with what we know we have for resources? And, right. you know, I think, I honestly do think we need to get a little bit more familiar with what the community needs may need. I know you have some data on what the crisis response and probably like you said, Erica, John does too. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know how we fit that together when we're still trying to find, you know, a place to land on how to fund it. You know, if we, for instance, if we contract with somebody, I can take that out of a board of health budget. That's not a, that's not a mm -hmm. payroll budget. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Once it, you hire somebody, it gets switched to another budget. So we would need to add that to Board of Health. I would think that's how it's been described to me. And based on reading the draft job description that was sent to me, it really is a Board of Health function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lisa, did you want to? I'm just, my hand was still up from before. So I didn't lower, I didn't lower her hand. I had been lowering well, people's I mean, hands. So just. <laughs> No, I mean, we, we don't want to belabor this too much because it's getting late, but so yeah. in terms of like you, we have to have the funding. So funding sometimes for these kinds of things comes from grants. So is there a structure where someone that's not a town employee can write a grant, work on a grant to get funding for a town position? Or does that have to be something internally that- You can, you can do it that way. Many places do it that way. A lot of the grants that we get from the state, we get help from the COG for that because that's what they do. Um, the, the piece of that is, and the question that is going to come up and John is listening to me and he's probably laughing. The question is going to, going to come up. What is the sustainability plan for this, for a position like this? How do you make it sustainable? And so we don't know about the billing question. We occupy, I mean, functionally, I know clinicians can do that, but when it's a town, it could be different. Those are the things that are unknown for us. I will say just from experience of the experience of watching EMS, they have a billing company, but there's a point where the billing company, you know, they go through their billing process. They, they actually functionally do the collections process as well. Uh, but there's a point where the town then has to take over. And so in the middle of that, we have to pay, we still have to pay the person. 
if the funding isn't, if the money isn't coming in to pay the person, we're still on the hook for paying the person because we've hired the position. So that's what I mean about if we don't have funding in place, then it could be a liability financially. The town has to meet from another source. And so, you know, I think we may have the ability to go through a grant program on the federal level that came through with ARPA. I don't think it's, I'm not sure, I shouldn't say I don't think, but I'm not sure that it, that it can come out of dedicated funds. I was looking at a bunch of different things today to sort of figure that out. I do know that there will be grants separate. So that separate grant program could be useful. Depends on how long that program goes. Do we have, would we be able to onboard a position like create it, onboard it, have a funding source and develop the sustainability, which is what I think Megan is saying. The sustainability may be there, but how do we fit that into a small town model? Because not every, not every department has the ability to do that. Most municipal departments don't pay for themselves. There's a few. And so you've got to figure out how we work that with the insurance, our insurance company to cover the liability. That's a cost. You've got the cost to hire the person. Um, you've got, if you're contracting, you don't pay some of that. So functionally, workers' comp, unemployment, all those costs, the, the coverage for liability for the performance under the clinical social workers' responsibility and, and licensure is different. And the insurance company has made that clear that we need to be, they need a lot more information before they'll tell us. So I, I'm willing to bet you that private, somebody who's working privately has their own liability insurance. Towns, the structure in a town for liability insurance, um, we have to parse that out because not every small town does this. And, and understand the difference between a larger community and Deerfield is we just don't have some of the costs that they do from an insurance perspective. So they have to tell, the insurance company has to tell us what, what they will pay for. And we have to figure out how much more money we would have to put in to our insurance funds to cover the liability on that. For instance, EMS functions, I think you all know this, EMS functions as an enterprise fund. So the money that comes in goes out for the function of EMS. It's, it's, it's segregated from the general fund. Most positions are not created that way. That's, that's an occurrence. Um, wastewater, same thing, enterprise fund. So even though those people are employees, some of the money that it costs the town to operate with those positions translates between the accounts. Um, there are wastewater treatment plants have a different level of responsibility. They have testing, they have a bunch of other things. EMTs, again, their, their certification program, you know, there's a, there's a coverage that the insurance company has to provide. It's much closer to what firefighters and police officers have to deal with. And we have separate insurance policies for those, not fire, but for police. So there's some statutory things that could come into, that come into play for police department that could correspond in a cost perspective if we had a, so, a community social worker. It's just these things are the things that they actually pay me to ask questions about. I think an interesting idea too, when you mentioned South County EMS is also whether it could be a you know, we have four town, we have four small towns and we have things that are regionalized like the EMS, yep. like, you know, uh, what was the other yep. one you were just talking about? Oh, the, the senior center. The senior center is regionalized. Yes. So that's an interesting idea too. I know we're getting long and probably kind of buy in with that be. So this is what I mean. There's a, there are questions out there that maybe could help us solve the problem, solve the problem of onboard. Right. But I mean, the schools might have concept. money. The schools might pay into this even, or it might, they might, you know, coordinate that with their counseling department because this could be. Functionally, they have a structure we don't. Yeah, exactly. And so that's a great question that I don't think anybody's yeah. asked, Erica. Nobody asked me, but I thought about it when you were talking. You and Megan were talking, and I was thinking, ooh, the schools have already done this. Right. Right. Again, let's not recreate the wheel. Right. 
and we talked about my my the committee that I'm on talked about regionalization because you know we know right it's not like money's growing on trees. Um, we just felt like uh, it it unless it was maybe a full time position that's then a regional position so that there is enough time in that person's day to really meet the community need. We just felt like oof, Deerfield could get lost in the shuffle pretty easily. Um, and so we're, you know, we're trying to be protective in terms of our community, but I totally and so get it. so you had right? this plan for 19 hours, right? Is that what you would originally yeah. assign to it? That's what, okay. Yeah, so that they wouldn't have to be benefited in the same way and trying to save the community some money. Um, and that, um, you know, in other small communities that we talked to, you know, community social workers were working on a part-time basis and they were like, yep, we're busy all the time. Every hour of the day <laughs> is spoken for. Um, but um, I, I guess I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm hearing you, Casey, and I'm really appreciating all the time you're all taking on this is that, you know, the committee that I'm on could potentially reach out to other community social workers and ask about liability, oversight and funding. And so let me ask what, you a question. Who did you yes. talk to? What communities did you talk to? Um, we talked to Haverhill. We talked to um, uh, Stowe, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And um, Ann Curtis talked to someone else out in Eastern Mass okay. and looked at you know what, what their tax rates were and their sort of community budget and everything. Um, okay. So yes, in answer to your question, to that that are the those are the things I would be thinking about. I was okay. just curious as to what you were it, having. More information would be useful. Okay, but again, okay. it's a new thing. Yeah, it's pretty common out in Eastern Mass. There, the the community social workers are much more common there, and every department, every person we talk to. It's like once they got the position and the community understood the benefit and started really accessing it. Sorry, my kids are yelling in the background. Um, a lot of these departments just grew and grew. Like they're like, oh, let's hire another full time outreach specific person. Oh, let's, you know, because the community started really benefiting and really seeing the need. And mm -hmm. the police departments got on board. They're like, oh, yes, thank you. Please, you know, please go meet with so-and-so person that's come in three times over the last three weeks on, you know, crisis calls or whatever it is. So I do agree with Erica that I think um, this kind of tr treatment, prevention, outreach saves communities money in the long run. It's just, it's hard to quantify that from the get-go. Right. Um, so we'll definitely reach out to all these different um, community social workers and get some more information about liability, oversight, funding, you know. And it may um, be something that they that need to coordinate with people like me. Yeah. I don't, I don't know yeah. what, uh, how those, how, like for instance, I don't know what form of government Stowe has. So if they have a town manager, mm -hmm. for instance, he yep. might, they might have a chief financial officer that handles, you know, the budget process and how you're coordinating your insurance and all that stuff. But functionally, that social worker should be able to tell you whether the town's carrying liability for them or they're carrying it and the town's paying for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what that looks like either. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to leave. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think we're all going to have to leave. My apologies. Next but... Thanks. Good to see you or hear you. Bye. Sorry. <laughs> Bye, John. Um, yeah, I would love to keep working, you know, as a citizen separate from this board too on this issue. So I get in touch with you separately. I think it's it's a great, you know, if we have a public health department, mental health should be part of that public health department. We, That's been probably the biggest mistake that we've made as a country and as communities and everything is to exclude mental health from health. <laughs> it's yeah. just health, right? It's like we check the restaurants and we make sure nobody is getting poisoned. We, you know, we make sure that there's no gas leaks. Like we also need to make sure our people's brains are, are okay. You know, we have an EMS for when people have heart attacks. And so. I'm sure they see this too. Yeah. So I we, bet you oh, yeah. that the I think the director EMS who's sitting be. here watching us talk about this could tell yeah. me that. I could see the EMS being a um, place that this could be a good connection. I also have the name of and information on the counselor at DA. I'm wondering if DA oh, would okay. found this. I mean, I could see DA just funding this. 
I mean, I don't want to say they would, but I could see DA, you know. Supporting it. Supporting, not funding. Certainly right? they may support it from a community perspective because it would probably benefit them as well. It would, um, and it would be a great PR for them in this day and age when teen suicide and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. talk to you, Megan and Lisa, and yeah, great. as a citizen, not necessarily as a member of this board, because I think it's, it's, yeah, it, it could change the feeling of this whole town and it could be a model. Yeah. yeah. And that's one Thank thing so it could much. be, that was brought to my attention too, is it could be a model for success. And all I'm trying to think through is how do we get from concept to go? Totally. Which is great. That's why you're so helpful because we're just like, I don't Let's know that I'm do helpful. It. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm just thinking about things functionally because I right. understand right. that that health challenge, that mental health challenge better than people think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And my, you know, the committee that I'm on, we're happy to do research. We're happy to send it to you, Casey. And I would um, like to see it. I really would. I'd be curious. curious. Oh. Yep. As possible. So a community yeah. like Stowe is definitely not the size of Haverhill. I would be curious to no. see how Stowe structured. They are yep. small. They're a little bit bigger than we are, but they're small comparatively because I know where Haverhill is. Yeah. I used to work at Haverhill. <laughs> La, it's they a much a lot bigger money. department. It's a city, so it's a much bigger structure. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. implementing something without the support piece, we got to keep that in mind is the, so the underlying support that allows the person to do their job to the best effect is important. And sometimes we don't think that through as mm -hmm. efficient, a, a, as well as we could, because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think of all the questions you guys have, I've, figured out three questions I could ask the insurance company just off the top of my head listening to this conversation. Yep. Great. Well, thank you for taking so much time and allowing me to speak and chime in. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I'll definitely talk to um, Anne and the other kind of committee members and we'll look at those questions specifically and we'll reach out to all our contacts and just get a bunch of info and send it your way. Okay. Thank you. And I'll pass it along. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Lisa, are you talking? Yes. I can't hear you. Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. I was just thanking Megan for all the work that they've done on this. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm wondering, since we've gone over like, what, two hours and 20 minutes, should we just do the, can we kind of chat? Um, what am I trying to say? Can we next month? Can we do that next month? Just yeah, let's do it next because we don't have we don't have our um, we don't even have a quorum now. We don't have a quorum anymore, right? Yeah, don't we don't have a quorum. You have quorum. Oh, we do because we have three. Oh, right. It's very right. confusing. Quorum sounds like four, doesn't it? Like four. <laughs> quorum sounds like it should be four, but it isn't. You have a five member board, so three gets you satisfies the more than fifty percent. Uh, okay. Confusing. Usually, you don't uh, like to do things without John, and I get that. I probably shouldn't have asked questions or talked, but honestly, well, some no, of these no, things no. just, I, they were sitting in my head and I don't know how to answer it. And I don't know how to, how to not be Debbie Downer on it, but no, I think it's great. I mean, a I, lot of things that have to be put into place to hire a person to do this kind of work. We have to be and specific I think if about it. Yeah. If we're serious about making this kind of change, we have to do it from a, you know, a place that's thought out and knows all this information. I think it's great. Yeah, I think Megan appreciated it too. So I we hope so. I mean, it's glad to hear. I'm glad to hear both your perspective and her perspective from where you sit, Erica, because I don't sit in that same space. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm the person that everyone's calling, and I have to turn down five to ten people a week. It's awful. That's really awful. Yeah, it's crazy, and I'm like, try this person, knowing that they're full too. Like, it's just. For teams. Um, everybody's inundated yeah 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 it's, it's did, really difficult i did a program for teens at the library this spring and you know six or seven teens came and it was great we did like a mindfulness and mental health program but you know you just feel like i and, and i went into all the health classes too and did it at the high school but like it's just it's so hard to get to the kids you know it's almost like they're you know, school is really where you get to the people and they haven't really been there 
a lot of them. So right. they haven't. And that's really the question in my mind with, with me. I mean, I love the idea of having more community mental health support. I'm just thinking about like, how, where is it going to function? Like, how is it going to sort of be positioned in order to, to, to have, to be able to be productive, you know, because the, yeah. the, frankly, the, that's why I think we should so consider sort of easing into it from a contract perspective, because we need to know where it's going to fit. It is a health function, mm-hmm. but how do we fit it? into the current employment structure that we have. And public health is- What do we know we're gonna need for services and and resources for this person? Right, how do we get to the people who need it? How do we make sure it's serving the people who need it? I I think it's a smart idea if we can get CHD, CSO, ServiceNet, they all have these type of programs. We get some- Yeah, yeah. You know, contracted. I think it's a great start. I mean, contracting is a great way to start. And really thinking of it as a systems thing rather than, okay, we, you know, it's not a, a mental health provider who's going to be providing like counseling for the people who need, who can't find a counselor. It's, it's like more fully systems based for the town and, right. and just like how, finding, find, defining what that looks like and, and how to, what that job description is and then how to have a person actually be able to do that. I think it's a huge need. It just needs to be fleshed out. And I, I don't know the details. I just, I want to know more. Yeah, that's why I definitely want to be involved. But we should probably wrap it up, right? Yes, let's wrap up. So we to- like being talked to by their families. Like, are we eating? I know, I'm like, ah. Can you- <laughs> I know, my, my dinner has been sitting next to me for I know, we're all I'm so sorry. I could not, I had an no, early light lunch and I was star- I was ready to faint. So I ate my food. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, but you so, did what I do. You turned your camera off. <laughs> I did. I was like, back I do. on and off. I was like, ah. So what's our next? Our next would be May. Can I ask a question? May 5th? Please, please, please. Oh, I know yeah. it's an off day for you guys. Yeah, we can come May 5th. I can come May 5th. Yeah, let me I just thought I, think I can. The reason I thought that is it. I think it provides the ability to really hear what Mary tells the select board. You've only got one member of the select board that, I shouldn't say that, you've got two. Um, Two members of the select board have some background now, but this is gonna be a a conversation that I think if you guys can participate with the select board, it has a much more robust um, conclusion. Okay. Or at least that's my feeling. That's the reason I I ask. If you can't, it's fine. Yeah, I can do that. I could do May 5th. Is that at six o'clock? Yes. Okay. Do we do we need to do? Is it? Are we joining another meeting, or do we need like our own agenda for this meeting? So I would post. So here's how I do this. I did this with, we did this with planning board. That's why we have so many select board meetings. Um. I had the select board post a separate agenda, so I would ask you to post a separate agenda. The same discussion topics would be on there. So review of the class comp study. Um, possibly COLA, depending on what Mary and, and um, Brenda and I sort of hit on and where we fall, where everything falls down. Um, definitely this question of the community outreach and community social worker uh, items. Because Mary, I think Mary can give you a better understanding of how she can evaluate these positions. So she's already seen the job description that Ann Curtis gave me. Um, And she looked at it from the perspective of, okay, this is a different thing from, you know, coordinator, like outreach, you know, fairly strict outreach. So I think she can at least explain maybe where it could fit because I'll ask her again. Yeah, yeah, that's, I I think- we can maybe put it into one of those one of the temp- uh, the template that we get. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how do we get there? Okay. So I'll do an agenda then for the fifth and which is pretty similar. That's all the same sort of stuff that was on for today. The it's only just- thing that would change is we would probably have to change the zoom information because we use yeah. a different account for the select board meeting. Okay. Should I update it? I can, I can make a new one and then share it with you and Jen and, I'll up- I'll, Jen and, and I will update, update it. it. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then we'll, 
that's it then we will we can adjourn move to adjourn and i wasn't trying to sort of usurp running the meeting it's just oh, the moderator no, no, piece no, of it i have to watch bad. people I, I feel bad because i don't I, you, you know you know a lot more about a lot of these things than all these things than i do so <laughs> I it's a hat it's a hat that i put on and take off <laughs> you have to, it's a hat i would like to know a lot more about <laughs> we have to set our next meeting before we adjourn so what is like yeah. not the May 5th, but the, not the, the May 5th, but the other one. So the next, the third, I had my calendar up. The third Wednesday, I mean, third Monday is the 17th, May 17th. Yeah. Should we do five again? Okay. We can. can cut Casey off. Um, did, I was, would I'd be happy to put tape on my mouth. Uh, um, does five work better for people? I don't know why it was switched to five. I'm fine with either. It goes, if it starts at six, it goes too late, John. Oh, okay. If it starts at five, it sometimes goes too late too. I know. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's starting at five doesn't mean we just go till seven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think that this, for today, there was a conflict with another meeting and that was why we went earlier, but, oh. um, but I'm, I can do, I can do five. Okay. You can just turn your cameras off to eat your dinner. That's, That's right. right. I'll, I'll bring food next time. Uh -huh. So, okay. So motion to, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, Ruling by Alex votes aye. <laughs> Erica in favor. Lisa in favor.